Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Kidney Conversations and I am super excited. You know, I always start off like that, right? But I really am. I'm super excited because I have Sharon Rouse here, Kindness for Kidneys. And I'm going to tell you something, my girl Winston Fowlby hooked me up with her via social media, but today is the first day that we actually see each other. And if I would have known she was a beautiful chocolate woman, have mercy, hallelujah, <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> so I want to hear all about Kindness for Kidneys. I want Sharon to tell us her story because uh, we follow each other, we try to support each other so much on social media, and we're waiting for COVID to be over so we can do some things together. You know, we have a 220 seat auditorium here uh, at the Bennett Career Institute, and we want to do some things together to bring awareness. So I want to hear all about Sharon Rouse, Kindness for Kidneys. Talk to me. Wow, I'm just, I'm elated to be here. Thank this you. has been a long time coming. Absolutely. When COVID hit, it was kind of like, dang, we, we were trying to get connected and everything. Um, but I will say, Chet, that my story began in 2006. Mm. I woke up one morning with swollen legs. At the time, I was a school counselor in the school system mm -hmm. and um, woke up with swollen legs. It started the night before, but when you work in a school system, you're just thinking, yeah. this is normal. That's you know, right. this is what what happens when you're on your feet all day mm -hmm. as a school counselor, you're running, you're doing everything. So I thought it was okay, it's normal. And then I woke up the next day and the swelling had come up further. Mm. So I was like, what, you know, what is going on? And so I had been diagnosed with lupus in 2003. Okay. I wasn't really sure that that was the diagnosis, but I went with what the doctor said. I took medicine for a short time and then I never had issues after that. Okay. So that was, you know, that was, that was, kind of like, okay, is this lupus related? I don't know. Went to work because I felt okay. I just mm -hmm. had the swelling, but I felt okay. I went to work and the school nurse, I just happened to be passing by and I said, you know, I woke up with swollen legs this morning. What do you think is going on? Mm -hmm. And he said, you need to get to the emergency room right away. And okay. I said, well, what, what do you think it is? I feel okay. And mm -hmm, he said, mm -hmm. well, this is, this is, it's not normal for your ankles, which I knew, but I'm thinking I could go after work. I'll be okay. Yeah. I'll just go check it out, see what happened. Maybe I ate something or, so I get to the emergency room and they do tests, lab work and everything. And they come back and they say, your kidneys are failing. Wow. And I said, really? I said, well, wh what do you think is causing it? And she said, well, if you were diagnosed with lupus, maybe this is lupus related. I had just had a child five months before that. Mm -hmm. And so she said, maybe this is related to that. You know, sometimes when you have a child, your body starts to work against itself mm -hmm. and you might just be having a lupus flare. So I said, okay, so they did a lot of tests. My doctor had me transferred to Johns Hopkins. He said, I want you to have the best care, so let me send you there. Okay. And so we get there and they decided to do a biopsy and they did the biopsy and they came back and they said, you know, this is rare. We thought it was lupus related, but it's not. This is a rare kidney disease, focal mm. segmental glomerulosclerosis, mm. which they call FSGS. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. You got to look at the camera and say that again, baby. Say that one more time. Yeah, so it's focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. And so it's, a part, it's when part mm. of your kidney cells become scarred. And there's no known causes. There, there are lots of things that could cause it, but they weren't able to pinpoint what, what, mine, what happened with mine and why it was... Um, FSGS. I never had a family history of that. No one in my family has been on dialysis that I'm aware of mm -hmm. um, or even with high blood pressure or diabetes or any of those types of issues. And so this particular kidney disease isn't necessarily caused by high blood pressure or um, or diabetes. Okay. It, it, it's, it's a rare condition that could be caused from different things. It could be mm. from a, a result of something else that you've gone through. It could be lupus, but they said the way that my kidney cells were in the, under the microscope, mm -hmm. this is a separate kidney disease. Okay. And so they even went back a year later and did it again to be sure because mm -hmm. you had the rheumatologist thinking one thing and then the nephrologist thinking another. And so when they went back, they said, no, this is FSGS. And so we're going to treat it as such. 
So if you don't mind, how old were you at that time when this so happened? So let's see, that was 2006. I was 31. Wow. 31 years old. Yeah. So here I am, a, a, a new mom. My world literally stopped oh that day. Um, my daughter was five months. I was nursing and all of that. I had to mm. stop nursing right away because they were giving me medications yes, that would yes. impact her. And so everything, I felt like my world just completely shifted that mm. day. It was just like I woke up in my normal routine, going mm -hmm. to, to work and, and everything. And then here I am, you know, hit with this news. So let me ask you this, which I normally ask most people, how was your mental psyche at that time? I wasn't sure how to take it. You know, in the beginning, you're shocked. It's just mm -hmm. like, how did this happen? Here I am, you know, thinking I'm living a healthy life. Yes, yes. And then you, it's almost like a Mack truck hits you, and then your, your world as you know it changes. I will say I, was, I, I decided to resign from my job okay. so that I could focus on my health at that time. And so I feel like in that moment, um, it, it really gave me some time to reassess and re reflect my life, period. Okay, okay. Um, I, I didn't really start to feel um, signs of depression or anything like that until I actually got the diagnosis, until I started dialysis six years later. Okay. So 2006, I got the diagnosis. My thing was, I'm gonna beat this. Mm -hmm, this is not mm -hmm. God's will concerning me, you know? And so I was determined that, no, you know, I don't know how, how this ended up at my okay. front doorstep. So, so, so let me ask you, so you're saying that you got the diagnosis, mm -hmm. and then you, six years later, you get on dialysis? Yes. So what happened in between the diagnosis and dialysis? Yeah, so they were able to give me immunosuppressant medications and okay. things like that to keep my kidneys at bay. Mm -hmm. um, and that did work up until the end of 2011. End of okay. 2011, it just started taking a nosedive. Gotcha. Just, they, they said, well, this is normal. We've been able to keep it steady all of this time. So you think your body just got adjusted to the medicine? Well, I, eventually I stopped taking it because I couldn't handle a lot of the immunosuppressant suppressing so now in hindsight I know it was because I was on too much yeah and if they had maybe tapered it down it probably would have been better because I'm on immunosuppressants now after transplant mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and I, I see the difference but at the time I didn't know I'm just going along with what they're telling me you gotcha. know so I um, so I, I ended up stopping and things were, were holding steady for a while. Okay. They did give me some blood pressure medication because mm -hmm. at that time, because my kidneys were going in the wrong direction, that okay. my blood pressure started to be impacted. Gotcha. And so they did give me some, um, in, um, some, some medication for that, blood pressure okay. medicine. And so, that kind of helped with the blood pressure. Got you. So then six years, let's fast forward ahead. So all of a sudden now, they give you the news mm -hmm. that you have to do dialysis. So how long did you have to be in the chair? So I, so before they gave me the news, I will say I was in denial with that. I, I tried everything. I went to every natural doctor. Yes, indeed. Amen. <laughs> you know, Amen. you can think of That's acupuncture, right. aqua chi, everything you can think <laughs> yes. of. I was like, oh, I'm not getting on no dialysis. Okay, That's So that right. was the first thing. I, I spent a couple of months doing that. Meanwhile, my kidneys were getting worse. And they were mm. like, you know, Ms. Rouse, you, you really need to consider I, I had missed out on several operations because my doctor really wanted me to transition to peritoneal. Okay. He said, you're young, you, you know, you have a young child. Tell everyone so, what that is. So peritoneal dialysis is when you do dialysis with, through what they call exchanges. So they put a catheter in your stomach, they put fluid and so there are bags of fluid that go into you. It cleans you out and then it pulls you back out by way of a machine or you can do it manually. Mm -hmm. And so, um, he wanted me to start that way. He felt like you're still, you're working. By this point, I'd taken a new job. I was back to life as normal as I thought, or mm -hmm. what I thought was normal. And um, so he wanted me to start that way. He said, I feel like this will be better for you. Okay. You're, you're working and all of that. And so I, um, I, I missed out on all of those appointments. I was like, no, give me some time, give me some time. And then finally, um, in late June of 2020, 2012, I ended up in the hospital with very low hemoglobin. It okay. was like a six. Wow. So I, um, I. So wait a minute, let me just say something to everyone. Yes. You know, what's really important is, and our story is starting to mirror, and um, what's important that I felt is, is that if you know that you're going to get, well, if not if you know, but once you get a diagnosis, you also need to do, Sharon did what I did, and that was I had to take some time to digest it. I did not, the doctor wanted me to start dialysis right then and there. They were scheduling right then and there. I said, no, I need you to give me a week or two yes. for me to try to get it together because to, to, for me to get sick 
and go to the emergency room and they tell you your kidneys fail. Yeah. Then I get up and go to another uh, a hospital and they tell me the same thing. So now I'm trying to figure out, okay, what am I going to do? Because the only thing that I don't know about you, but the only thing I've heard about dialysis was like old people on a machine yes. and it was like the worst thing in the world. Yes. So the same thing happened. I'm going to let Sharon, the same thing happened. So it was a situation where I just wanted to break to say to you, it's important for you to take time to get your mental psyche together before you do this kind of transition, because now you're embarking in a whole new way of living, yes. especially yes. with the retention of water and all that that you have to go through. Yes. So go ahead and finish. So yes. now after you did the after you figured out that, or once they put you on dialysis, um, so you was doing it from home. So no, because I waited so late, okay. because I did not go to those appointments, I, it, by that point it was an emergency. Like if you go, if we send, so I went to the hospital because of the low hemoglobin while I was there, they said, we really think you should, should think about getting on dialysis. At this point, your numbers aren't looking good. Mm -hmm. If we send you home, you could get a, a cold or anything, you're gonna die. Wow. Like you're, you're just not wow. in a healthy place right now. Okay. And so, you know, I, I said, well, let me pray about this. Mm -hmm. Because in my mind, I was like, I don't wanna jump out there not in faith, you know? And, um, and God basically said, Sharon, just because you're going dialysis doesn't mean you're not healed. That's right. You know, it doesn't mean that I haven't already taken care of you and, and the things that you're going to go through. And sometimes you don't know when your story, you sitting in that chair, Absolutely. may impact <clears throat> the people that are around you that would Absolutely. never step foot in the church. Absolutely. So it's like we want to be the church, but when That's it's right. time to really be the church, <laughs> we're like, wait a minute. This, okay. This ain't God's will concerning me, you know. <laughs> and so he said, hey, you know, man. sometimes it's not, it, you got to take yourself out of That's it. That's right. But you, I really had to come to that space. And okay. I went through, I tell people all the time, when you receive a diagnosis like that, you almost go through a grief, grieving process. True. You know, you, you're in shock, then mm -hmm. you're de in denial, then you're angry. Like, why is this happening to me? Absolutely. I try to live a healthy life. Absolutely. I try to treat people the way they're, they're, they're supposed to be treated. And then here I am on this machine. And I think for me, that's where the depression started. Mm -hmm. I've been a Christian since I gave my life to God at 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And so I've been in church since 12 years old. So when this happened, mm -hmm. and then especially when people didn't pop up like I thought they would mm -hmm. for a transplant, yeah. the depression really kicked in. Yeah. And I think for me, and I, and I wanna hear from you, for me, it was by me owning a business, I still came to work every day for the few hours that I could until they called me to the chair. Mm -hmm. So by me taking on more of a passion to dump everything into my business, mm -hmm. that was the only thing that kind of helped me through along with some other things to kind of help me through. But my question is why you, how long were you in dialysis, first of all? Mm -hmm. So I was on for about a year and a half. I okay. started in, in center um, because they had to do the emergency dialysis mm -hmm. um, catheter. They put that in my chest. So I started in center hemo. And then because I was still working, like you said, going to work, trying to handle all of that, um, I transitioned to peritoneal. Okay. So about a year after I transitioned to peritoneal and I did that for about six or seven months until I had the transplant. So let me ask you this. So now, where your doctors keep trying to uh, insist like a fistula and get rid they, of the poor. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> they, said, they kept Rouse, coming to me. Yeah, this is not safe and it's by your heart. You could have a heart attack. Yes. And, and I'm like, but at this point we knew my sister was a match. So I was like, can oh, I just okay. hold Very off? Good. Yes, can I hold off until our surgery at this, I don't want to go get a fistula and I know she's a match and we're going to end up on the operating table. Now I didn't know all the twists and turns my sister and I would encounter for okay. a whole year before we made it to the operating table. So that's why I transitioned to per peritoneal. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, Sharon, uh, because they kept on trying to get me off of, but I had a strong faith in God. I kept on saying, mm -hmm. Oh, no, 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 this isn't going to happen. No, no, I'm about to get a donor. I'm about to get a donor. <laughs> and even though it was looking bleaker and bleaker every day, I just yes. kept saying, I'm going to get a donor. I'm going to get a donor because I had complications to the point where, uh, because it's only a 30 minute show, we're going to have to bring you back to talk because I want to hear about the ups and downs yes. of the sister too. But I had complications to the point where at one point, I believe that the way that the hospital system was set up, that it was it was set up for me to die. And that's the way I felt because the short version was my, my port stopped working. But at that point, I was in between insurance companies. Mm -hmm. And because I didn't have insurance for a, a, a short period of time, mm -hmm. they would not touch me. They would not do it. So I'm saying because I don't have insurance, I'm going to die because of my preconditioned illness. 
it was just terrible. Mm -hmm. So it's something that you'll hear when I testify on Congress about if mm -hmm. they start some mess about uh, us when it comes to uh, diagnosis and medication and insurance and all that yeah. because I had the worst experience. So real quick before we go to break, give me a little bit about them tossing turns between you and your sister. Yes, yeah, so so we knew she was a match at the end of 2012. We had actually gotten a, the surgery date and everything, November okay. of 2012. And then two weeks before I ended up getting shingles. <laughs> wow. So I was like, oh my goodness, here we are. Two weeks, we had already had our pre-op and everything and I ended up getting shingles. And so they had to cancel the surgery. Well, after they canceled that surgery, she, we went back to get the next surgery, which was going to be that January. They set mm -hmm. a new date. And then all of a sudden they said, well, wait a minute, her hemoglobin levels aren't where we need them to be. So your hemoglobin levels, normal is about 11 to 15 and up, well, 11 and up. And hers were about 10, 10.5. And she said, you know, this is, this is my normal. This is what I've always been. Mm -hmm, I, I had mm -hmm. a child two years ago. This is my normal. And, and then after that, we... Um, when you know they she she had to go through a lot of different things to prove that this was her normal. her normal so she ended up having two bone marrow biopsies i don't know if you've right. heard of a bone marrow biopsy that's one of the most painful, painful. ones yes. that you can get but she was so determined and she has her own story about her determination and she felt like this was her 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 purpose for living at that point. She was in a low space. So. Which is really good. So listen, so we're going to take a break, but that gave me a really good uh, idea to bring back Sharon and her sister because part of the purpose of Kidney Conversations is we want to make especially the African-American community feel comfortable becoming a, a donor, an organ donor. And we want to hear the, the ups and the downs, the good and the bad, so, we can, so people can make an intelligent decision. So we're going to take a commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to hear about how did Sharon start Kindness for Kidneys. We'll be right back after these messages. Hey guys, and thanks for sticking with us here on Kidney Conversations. I'm excited because Sharon Rouse is here, told us an amazing story. I already told her we're definitely going to get with our producer and book her again with her sister. We want to really get into that dynamics of being a kidney donor and a recipient and also sister. So we really want to get into that. So Sharon, talk to me about, I was introduced to ki Kindness for Kidneys. Tell me all about that. Sure. So, so Kindness for Kidneys actually was a vision that God gave me while I was sitting in a dialysis chair. After I had kind of gotten past me and the fact that this was happening to me, and, and, and my first thought was, well, what can I do to help someone else? You see a lot when you sit at a dialysis facility, as yes. I'm sure you're aware, you see a lot. And so my thought was, how can I take this experience and help someone else? Yes. Like answer some questions before they get here mm -hmm. or educate our community. I guess I was shocked when I walked into a facility the first day. And I'm like, if, if we're disproportionately impacted by this, why aren't we having conversations about Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Why aren't we talking about this? And Absolutely. I know in our community, typically, we don't sit at the dinner table and talk about our health issues. Mm -hmm. We're taught you're strong, you, get, you do what you got to do and keep it moving. Yes. But I'm like, if we're disproportionately impacted by this, why aren't we talking about it so that we can prevent our loved ones from getting in the chair as well? And Absolutely. so I was sitting there like, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. You know, this is not a good thing. You know, you come in and you see empty chairs because someone has transitioned. Mm -hmm. um, but then there were times that you see empty, empty chairs because someone got a transplant. So that was good as well. So I, I got to ask you this. Now, have you experienced someone going into, let's say, a cold red kind of situation with yes. you in a chair? How many yes. times? Uh, I would say about two or three times. The to times me, that it I... was more times that I want to even think about. Yeah. And of course, OK, so tell me, I don't want to put words in your mouth. How was you perceiving you at that time? So I was just pain, l l the way I was feeling when I was yes. watching. So I was, I was, I was concerned, but I would say I, it made me even more um, aware of making sure that I advocate for myself. If Absolutely. I'm coming in here and they're telling me they're taking off three liters of fluid, and I know that I'm still going to the bathroom, mm -hmm. then I'm going to make another suggestion. And not that I came in nasty or anything like that. I actually really liked the people that were working with me. Okay. Um, but I just made sure I advocated for myself. If I came in and I weighed myself, because you weigh yourself every time you go into the facility, mm -hmm. and I wasn't necessarily at my dry weight, you know, I'd let them know I'm, I'm still going to take off about one, no more than 1.5 today. 
Okay. You know, and so sometimes people aren't aware of that and knowing your body, that's so important to know. Like, I'm still going to the bathroom, so mm -hmm. I am going to release some fluid that's so right. you don't have to take off and, three and four or five kilos, and you I, know? And I think that it is important because a lot of times we have the seniors who come in there and they just go off of what the nurses uh, tell them that they're going to do for that day. And if you know your body, because Sharon is right, there are times when I will go there and they would take so much fluid off that now I'm cramping. So now I'm having issues and I was still going to the restroom as well. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I keep saying going to the bathroom, because sometimes people on dialysis, they don't go, they don't use the restroom. That's the purpose of going to dialysis. However, for me, it became to the point where um, I had to advocate for myself, yes. for things that I saw and because I know my body. And then I also had to learn how to get myself together because I knew I was going to have treatment. Yes. You know what I'm yes. saying? And <laughs> yes. I know for me, I was Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Mm -hmm. I was TTS Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Okay. Yes. And for me being Monday, Wednesday, and Friday in the chair, that weekend would kill me because of the fluid intake. By the time Monday come, I'd be begging to get treatment because I would be so bloated yeah. that I would want to get all that fluid off of me. So. Um, so you, because of that, and you wanted to bring awareness, Yes. Uh, you created... Kindness for Kidneys. So I had my transplant in December, on December 2nd, 2013. Okay. After that, I kind of, you know, had the ideas that I was th throwing around. And then in 2018, I said, I'm going to jump out there. I'm going to start. You know, sometimes you feel like you don't have everything you need to get started. Mm -hmm. And because I wasn't familiar with the nonprofit space... Mm -hmm. I felt like, let me wait, let me get some training on this and, and still working full time as well. And so in 2018, December 2018, we, we launched, we had a, a gathering and invited people to bring things for Dialysis Warriors. So they brought blankets and, and mm -hmm. neck scarves Beautiful. and pillows and Beautiful. stuff like that. And so that was our first initiative. I wanted to go back to my facility and just bless the patients that were sitting in the yeah. chair. I wanted to let them know we're thinking about you. You know, I remember what it was like to sit there mm -hmm. on holidays, mm -hmm. like and not knowing how you're going to feel and how, you know, if you yes, even had yes, family to go yes. to see you know so I felt like let me let me do something for the dialysis warriors that mm -hmm. are going to be um, that are going to be sitting in the chair during the holidays so that was our first initiative we collected as a result of having the launch we were able to collect hat scarves gloves blankets Beautiful. neck pillows mm -hmm. um, work uh, word puzzles things like that that I thought about that they could use while they're sitting in the chair a journal, all mm -hmm. of that stuff, and we packed them up and we took them the week of Christmas and we sang Christmas carols for the dialysis warriors as they were going in and out of the facility. So we just stood in the foyer oh, and just sang and beautiful. they were going in and out of the uh, of the facility and we hand them their care packages and just say, you know, have a beautiful. Merry Christmas. We're thinking so let me about ask you. you. This. <clears throat> because at the Sea Island Foundation, we do some of the same things. So how did you, I want you to, and this is important because we had to wrap up soon, I want you to tell our viewing audience how important it is for them to give and the reason why i say that is because we do the uh kidney christmas mm -hmm. and uh and we party we have a dj and we we watch the dialysis patients dance and some of them in the wheelchair and all that and we give them the care packages as well but i want you to tell our viewing audience mm -hmm how important it is to give, especially yes. when we do things like that. Yes, it's so important. First mm. of all, when you do things like that, you're bringing awareness, Absolutely. not just for the, the warriors that are there dancing, but for those that are around. Because nine times out of 10, there is someone in your family that is dealing with dialysis or something like that. So it's so important so that we can get resources into the hands of people in our community to make sure that they're aware. We want to we want to we want to at some point prevent this from happening exactly. and taking over our communities. Mm -hmm. And so it's so important to give to organizations like the Sea Island Foundation so that we can continue and expand our reach, that we'll have the resources that we need to reach all of the dialysis warriors that we need to reach. And gotcha. so by you providing funds, it helps us to continue our fight against this horrible disease. And I think that that is what we really want to stress because yes. I would admonish all of you who are watching us today to uh, uh, give to kindness for kidneys. And I'm going to tell you why. It's because uh, Sharon is doing some things that uh, the foundation aren't able to do at this time. And like, for an example, I want her to talk to us about the support group. Mm -hmm. And I want you to understand that 
it takes money for us to do these things. Like for an example, with the Kidney Cafe, I have to go to the grocery store every time, mm -hmm. you know, and be able to do the things that we do. I have to pay staff, mm -hmm. there's lighting, it's just a lot through yes. makeup, all of yes. that. And it's important for us to be able to put on a professional uh, 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 show or just a professional event mm -hmm. to show everyone how important it is and how far your money will go yes for us to be able to continue to help people because what was Sharon, I think a lot of people don't know is when you in treatment, see, we were young, mm -hmm. we can go to work. There's a lot of people, once they got on dialysis, yes. it's no more work. And so now they're on disability and we know what disability would do for us. Mm -hmm. So I say even sometimes, uh, one time we gave out um, Uber and Lyft gift cards yes. because they complained so much about the different free services mm -hmm. to take them to uh, dialysis yes. and stuff. So it's important that you give, and especially to uh, Kindness for Kidneys, because not only because they're here today, but because of all the things that they do. Tell us about the support group, yes. and then tell us about the other activities that you're doing. Yes, so um, <clears throat> the support groups, it, it's, it's interesting when the pandemic hit, we had had our first meeting in person at the Oxen Hill Library okay. on March 8th. <laughs> 2020. Wow. And so this is when the chatter was just starting about the pandemic. And mm -hmm. so we, our goal was to have it for the Southern Maryland region of Maryland, because okay. I felt like where are the support groups out here and who's going to drive to DC, mm -hmm. you know, during the week for an evening session support group. So let's start one here. So we and so as a result, it, it really ended up being a blessing in disguise because now we have people joining from all over the U.S. So we have wow. people from Seattle, from Florida that will tune in. And we have a, a guest speaker that typically comes. We have a topic. We gear our topics towards the things that people have mentioned to us that they want to, um, to, to, to know more about and talk more about. And so we, um, we, we have a guest speaker each month and, and we definitely want you to come on at the sidebar <laughs> at some point. Um, I think that's wonderful. Yes. And, and, and the reason why I think it's wonderful is because of the situation where I've been getting calls from with emails on the Kitty Cafe site from Chicago and other places, Pennsylvania, other places, mm -hmm. talking about uh, trying to be a part of the movement. Mm -hmm. And I never thought of virtual kind of thing. So that's really yes. good that and you're And we didn't think that. about it either until the pandemic hit. And it's like, so oh, how, we would still they, have... how would they get you? Virtually? So they can go to kindnessforkidneys.org or email us at kindnessforkidneys at gmail.com. Okay. Um, and so basically we, we publicize it on our social media websites and with the Zoom information on actually awesome. on the flyer. So if you're following Kindness for Kidneys on Instagram or Facebook, you'll definitely see each month we post a flyer that has the Zoom information right on there. No Awesome. password required or anything because awesome. we want people to feel comfortable coming and um, so we do that we also have continued our Christmas drive for the last few years now last year we couldn't go sing mm -hmm. but what we did that is we so partnered nice. with Magic Kitchen um, which they have dialysis friendly it's a dialysis friendly meal service so they okay. do different types of meal services but they have one specifically for dialysis warriors so they ship meals to the local facilities. We have five facilities that participated, 300 patients, and we ship meals to those facilities. Wow. And they were already prepackaged for them in coolers with a card to say, hey, we're sorry we can't be there to sing Christmas carols with you yes. and celebrate you this year, but this is just something to let you know we're thinking about you. Um, and then it also encouraged them to continue to with their healthy eating or what gotcha. I guess what you would call healthy eating for a dialysis warrior. Yes. And so, yeah, so that's what we've done so far. We're two and a half years in, so I'm excited about the road ahead. But those are the things, the support group right now. And um, we do informal things with families. When a family's newly diagnosed, we'll yes. do informal meetings with them through Zoom just to let the family know what's going on mm -hmm. and explain to them. My sister, have told, we've told our story several times to families just That's in hopes right. that someone would come forward to be a donor. Or, and that they would just understand what their loved one is going through and how they can better support them. So let me ask you a question. Since we're talking about donating and all of that, mm -hmm. how are you currently able to do all the things that you're doing? I have a better life now <laughs> through, through, through a living donor, through my sister. Um, the energy to do the things that I dreamed about doing when I was sitting in that dialysis mm -hmm. chair. And so um, I, I'm able to do it through the energy that I have and the committees that, that um, work with me, but also through the donations. Okay, because that that's where I was going. Yeah, so we, you can't do it without to, the donations. You're able to do this with the donations. We, we, last year was our, it's, it's interesting, we were in the middle of a pandemic, but I would say that was our best fun, fundraising 
year ever Perfect. because people were in a position to give and that way we were able to service more patients mm -hmm. and so um, again going back to your point it's so important to get involved to donate because it, it, it allows us to expand our reach yes. and so especially in our community there's so many people that are dealing with this horrible disease and as you know sometimes it doesn't show up until it's on this last stage Absolutely. so you we and could we could be walking around with this mm -hmm. thing you know you never know how it's going to impact you so I feel like donating and getting involved ahead of time is a way of being proactive yes. not waiting until you're sitting in the chair yourself or mm -hmm. your loved one is sitting in that chair but being proactive and getting involved and learning about the signs and the things to look for so that not only can you help yourself but you can help other people got you so in closing what would you say would be your um, your biggest success mm -hmm. in reference to kindness for kidneys so i would say our biggest success would be the number of people we've been able to reach and the number of people that will send us an email like thank you so much you have no idea how much i pray for a support group mm -hmm. i'm thinking of a caregiver and, and she and her husband come every 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 month Yes. And she said, you have no idea. This was a dream come true for, uh, for me as a caregiver to be able to further support my husband. So I would say it would be the impact that we've had so far in just two and a half years. Um, the awesome. people that we've been able to reach, the people that we've been able to put tools in their hands yes, so that they could yes. be better advocates for themselves. I think it's wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been my honor and privilege today to sit with Sharon Rouse kindness for kidneys what we want what we want you to do is on the screen you're going to see her information we want you to uh, get in touch with them if you want to join the support group if you want to donate to the organization we're going to be doing a lot of things together i just i love her spirit first of all she has beautiful skin oh, thank you we didn't provide makeup <laughs> services for her today and she came in flawless <laughs> and then you. the important thing is we have to support each other yes. and that's what it's about so we thank you sharon thank you for so coming much. in and we look forward to seeing you and we definitely going to book her to come back with her sister yes. so we can really get more into kindness for kidneys it's been a pleasure thank you so much this so, has been a great opportunity and I, I appreciate it. So we look forward to seeing you next week. Where on Kidney Conversations.